Good day, everybody. Uh, this counts as our asynchronous lecture for Econ 170, uh, Public Economics and Regulation for March 29th. Um, instead of having a synchronous class today, we're having an asynchronous class, which means we don't have an official Zoom meeting. Um, and so today what we're going to do is I'm going to go over some of the most common um, multiple choice questions from the midterm. I'm going to go over the midterm in general. I'm going to go over uh, multiple choice problems that a lot of people had difficulty with and explain them and then talk about the short answer problems and then what we'll be doing in the next couple of weeks going forward. Um, hopefully this is super productive and useful for you. Um, you can watch this anytime this week and we will return to a normal schedule starting Friday, April 2nd. Um, so what we're going to do first is go through a couple of the multiple choice questions that a lot of people seem to get wrong. Um, there were a lot of questions that a lot of people got right. And so I feel like generally we did pretty well on this. Um, but I want to make sure we review anything you have questions about. If there's stuff you still have questions about that we didn't go over in this video, please feel free to mention it in the discussion thread on the midterm um, or email me. Um, but if you use that discussion thread, then everybody can see it. So let's get started. The first question that some people had difficulty with, um, about half of the class got this right, which means the other half got it wrong, is the primary instruments of economic regulation. And this comes from that chapter where we did the introduction to economic regulation, talking about how we can regulate firms with too much power, uh, natural monopolies, um, using economic tools. And the primary instruments of economic regulation are price, quantity, and entry and exit. So the other things are valid. We do use legislation um, and so legislation, implementation and deregulation was another popular response. And those are the stages of economic regulation. So we usually legislate some economic regulation, then implement it, and then sometimes we deregulate it. Um, but that's not really how we do the economic regulation. The tool, the mechanism is regulating prices, regulating quantity, and regulating entry and exit. Uh, the other option, marginal cost, average variable cost, average total cost, those are ways we can measure um, predatory pricing and sort of look at as a guideline for what's an appropriate price for a natural monopoly, but it's not really an instrument of economic regulation. It's a subset of regulating price and how we might do that. Uh, so hopefully that makes sense. So the primary instruments of economic regulation are price, quantity, and entry and exit. So we can tell firms, this is the price you set your good or service at in a natural monopoly. Um, this is how much you have to produce for the market or how much you have to make available to the market, um, how many firms can be in the market, whether or not they're allowed to exit, things like that. Um, and then there were other instruments of economic regulation that weren't the major ones, things like advertising. We talked about different types of advertising that's allowed or not allowed um, and that kind of thing. Um, quality regulation is another one, but the two primary or the three primary instruments are that price, quantity and entry and exit. Um, the next one that people seem to have a little bit of trouble with was um, the question on a on types of collusion. So in a market featuring an oligopoly, firms sharing pricing information through industry events, industry events or publications so they can clearly convey pricing strategies to each other is an example of tacit collusion. So it's not explicit collusion because they're not calling each other up and saying, hey, this is how we should work together. Hub and spoke collusion is when firms collude with um, either retailers, so a producer colluding with a retailer or vice versa. And so it's this idea that there's a system of, say, um, uh, an industry producer colluding with um, retailers or vice versa. That was the example of the toy store. Um, collaborating with the goods producers. Um, and so it's this idea that there's lots of retailers in the um, sort of colluding with a single um, producer. Does that make sense? I'm not quite explaining that well. So think about it this way, right? We had um, in the toy example, we had retailers like Toys R Us, and um, I don't know, let's say Target and Walmart. And they were colluding with a producer. 
And so you get that hub and spoke relationship, right? That sort of retailers colluding with the sort of higher level or the previous vertical firm. Um, another example of it would be if we were all producing sodas and we collaborated with the makers of the aluminum cans, right? So it's a, um, an input producer collaborating with the next stage of production or the retail or something like that. So that's hub and spoke collusion. Tacit collusion is when firms collude tacitly, not explicitly, but sort of casually without saying it. So um, an example of tacit collusion from daily life might be if you're taking an exam and you see the person next to you stressing and you just sort of like back away from your exam paper so they can look at it. You didn't make that plan, but there is a sort of a, a tacit agreement that you're going to give them access to your information. Um, and so again, with tacit collusion, it's not explicitly decided, it's not communicated, but by putting that out there, you're giving the other firms the opportunity to engage in the same sort of pricing behavior that you engage in. So the example of airlines publishing fares in industry magazines um, meant that, um, in industry publications, meant that other airlines knew what they were going to be doing price-wise and they could match it so that consumers couldn't um, exploit price differences. And so they would behave like a, a monopolist, like a collude, like in collusion without having explicitly talked about it. So that's tacit collusion. Um, one of the reasons that collusion, um, collusion often fails, there's an incentive to break deals, it requires compliance, coordination is difficult, um, but if firms are able to collude, firms um, will definitely profit. Um, it's gonna benefit profit maximizing firms because they can either reduce quantities or raise price or both in order to maximize profits. So um, that's uh, the three reasons collusion fa uh, does fail and one reason collusion doesn't fail is that it maximizes profits. Um, about a third of people missed this one. Um, this is sort of a the kind of question I don't love to ask all the time because it's a uh, it's an important question though. So I asked true or false section two of the Sherman Antitrust Act makes it illegal for a firm to have a monopoly. It's false. Being a monopoly is not illegal. Remember, it's monopolizing the market that's illegal. And so that's a really important distinction. So even though I don't love that question, it's a little bit of a gotcha e question. It is important. And then the last one that some people had difficulty with um, was pricing below marginal cost may be rational for a firm if they are trying to break into a market. That's known as penetrative pricing. So remember, um, predatory pricing is pricing below... Um, Pricing so low that you force other firms out of the market. It's predatory. You're behaving in a predatory manner. You're trying to kill off other firms. Penetrative pricing is you're trying to break into the market, get through that barrier that other firms have created um, because of some barriers to entry or something like that. So that's an important distinction. Otherwise, in general, people did really well on the... Um, on the multiple choice portion, a lot of the grades were in the B and A area. So that's always really good to see. That makes me happy because that means that you were paying attention or the questions were too easy. Um, we're gonna say that you were paying attention and learned this stuff really well. And that is good for me. Now let's go to the short answer portion. Um, the short answer portion hopefully wasn't too challenging. I'm in the process of grading them right now. If you have specific questions, please do let me know. Um, there were, what is it, three problem or four problems and an extra credit problem. Um, and so we'll go through that and I'll go ahead and show you on my screen as we go through that. And hopefully that makes it a little more interesting than just looking at my face. So let's do that. So here is the short answer portion of the midterm. The first one is a prisoner's dilemma problem. And so what I ask you to do is solve this prisoner's dilemma by first finding the dominant strategies for the two firms and then talking about the Nash equilibrium and the optimal outcome. So I'm gonna go ahead and um, draw it up here too, just for the sake of having it. But we have two firms here and they can either adopt a workplace safety equipment um, and they expect 
their profits to be a function of adopting that workplace safety equipment. So the expected profit after deciding to adopt or not adopt the two competing firms that sell uh, similar goods is shown below. So we have firm one can adopt or not adopt. You know what, I don't think I do have to draw this on the board. And firm two can also. The way we solve a prisoner's dilemma is we hold one person's behavior constant, one actor's behavior constant, and then see what the second actor would do, and then do the same for the other side. So what we'll start doing is we'll start with holding firm one constant at adopt. So I'm going to highlight that. And so if firm one adopts the new safety equipment, firm two has to decide what to do. Firm two can either adopt and earn profits of $500 or don't adopt and earn profits of $600. So if you were firm two, what would you do? Would you choose to adopt or not adopt? Hopefully you'd say, wow, 600 is more than 500. That's definitely what I want to do. And so I'm going to go ahead and draw a little circle over what firm two would do. Here we go. Give me a second here. make this just right. There we go. So firm two, if firm one adopts, firm two will not adopt. Now let's look at what firm two would do if firm one doesn't adopt. So we'll hold firm one constant at adopt, at don't adopt, and see what firm two should do. So if firm one doesn't adopt the new workplace safety, Firm two can either adopt and earn $150 or not adopt and earn $200. If you were firm two, what would you do? Would you adopt or not adopt? Again, $200 profit is higher than $150 profit, so not adopting makes the most sense. So we're going to tend to see, oops, here we go. Firm two, well, what did that do? There we go is going to choose to, there we go, not adopt in that case also. So now we know that firm two has a dominant strategy. No matter what firm one does, their best strategy is to not adopt the new safety features. So firm two has a dominant strategy. Now we can hold firm two constant and ask the same question. So let's put that in here. Okay. So now we're going to do the same thing. I'm going to take these out. We're going to do the same thing for firm one. Now we're going to assume firm two is going to adopt and we want to see what firm one should do. If firm two adopts the new safety features, firm one has the choice between adopting and getting $500 profit or not adopting and getting $600 profit. If you were firm two, or sorry, firm one, if you were firm one, what would you do? If you're firm one, you have the choice between adoption, $500 profit or not adopting $600 profit, you're going to choose to not adopt, right? You want that higher profit. We can look at the same thing if we have firm to not adopt, and we're going to see that same outcome. And this is what we expect in a prisoner's dilemma. The way the payout functions are, even though they're better off in one spot, there's a dominant strategy to end up in another spot. So here, take a look. Firm two does not adopt the workplace safety equipment. Firm one has the choice between adopting and making $150 profit or not adopting and making $200 profit. They're going to, they have a dominant strategy now, right? They're going to choose to not adopt if firm two doesn't adopt. So no matter what firm two does, firm one is made best off by not adopting the firm, the, um, the workplace safety equipment. So firm one has a dominant strategy to not adopt the safety equipment and firm uh, one 
also has a dominant strategy to not adopt the workplace safety equipment. And we can look at it and see it. Oops, here, right? If we put those two dominant strategies together, that gives us our Nash equilibrium. Come on. There we go. So, firm two has an incentive or has a dominant strategy to not adopt and firm one has a dominant strategy to not adopt. And so we're gonna see that the Nash equilibrium is the place where neither firm has any incentive to change their behavior. So the Nash equilibrium is don't adopt, don't adopt. Both firms have that dominant strategy. If we get to that point where they're both making $200 profit, neither firm has an incentive to adopt the strategy and, um, and move out of that square. So if we think about this square now being our Nash equilibrium, oops, and I'll highlight it in, let's say purple. Um, if firm two is here making $200 profit, um, they would have to, if they choose to adopt the new safety features, they'd go from here to here and lose $50 profit. They would never do that. Firm one, on the other hand, they're here at don't adopt. If they choose to adopt the safety features, they go from 200 to 150. So there's no incentive to move. On the other hand, what would be the optimal outcome? The optimal outcome, if they both adopt the safety equipment, they'd actually both make way more money. They'd both make $500 in profit, but that's not a stable outcome because if you look here at that $500 profit, if firm one is here at $500 and they've adopted the safety equipment, they could be made better off by not adopting, by getting rid of the safety equipment, by not installing it, right? That move from adopt to not adopt increases their profits from 500 to 600. So even though it's optimal, it's better off, we can all see that's the square that has the highest profits for everybody. It's not stable because there is an incentive to leave, just like we see over here. If this is firm two's profits and they're both adopting, they're better off. 500, 500 is better than 200, 200. But if firm two chooses to not adopt, they move over to this square and they increase their profits. So the optimal outcome of adopt, adopt gives the highest level of total welfare but is unstable because there is an incentive to change the firm's choice in pursuit of higher profits. And then I go through and fix all my typos. Does that make sense, hopefully? If not, let me know. This is the, this is the outcome of a, of a prisoner's dilemma is this Nash equilibrium with this sort of missed out on better optimal outcome. So it's a pretty standard outcome. Cool. Next problem here says this graph below indicates monopolists price and quantity indicate the deadweight loss associated with monopoly power in a market. Where would a regulator hoping to increase welfare to perfect competition level set price? what would the competitive quantity supply be? Basically what you need to do for this is find the firm's monopolist quantity price level and then the perfect competition point. And so we can do that here. The monopolist is gonna produce, every profit maximizing firm is gonna produce at marginal revenue equal to marginal cost. So that's gonna be right here is the monopolist's production point. 
a monopolist is going to produce 100 units and they're going to charge a price, the highest possible price they can, which is going to be based on the demand curve. So a monopolist is going to produce 100 units and charge $65. In perfect competition, a firm would produce over here, oh goodness, behave, dots, um, at this higher quantity and lower price where marginal cost is equal to the demand curve. And so if we wanted to look at the dead weight loss associated with a monopolist, it's going to be, and you can do this a hundred different ways. Well, not a hundred. You can do this a bunch of different ways. You can draw the area, which is this dead weight loss here, right? That's the dead weight loss associated with a monopolist. It is also the area of a triangle with a base of 30 and a height of 15. So one half 30 times 15 um, gives you the area or the total value of that dead weight loss. So um, the triangle has, goes from 100 to 130. So it has a base of 30. And it goes from 40 to 65. So that means it has a height of $15, right? Oops. So one half base times height gives us our dead weight loss value of 30 times 15 times 0.5. $225 of welfare, the area of that triangle, that's the dead weight loss. That is the welfare loss associated with monopoly power in this market. If I were a regulator, if we were regulators trying to increase welfare to competition levels, we would set price at $40 and the competitive quantity would be 130 this yellow dot here. Hopefully that makes sense. This shouldn't be too new. I know, you know, your econ... 1B or 100B might have been a long time ago, but this is pretty standard stuff, right? Um, looking at how a monopolist reduces welfare. So hopefully this wasn't too challenging. Uh, short answer problems are pretty more specific. Uh, <laughs> why is pricing for a two-sided platform different than pricing for other goods? How do two-sided or two-party platforms set prices? What can we infer about the fact that companies like Facebook and Google charge very little for their users or nothing? So the main thing is that with two-party platforms or two-sided platforms, um, you can break down the price for each side differently depending on the value associated with being on the platform. So you basically have two pricing structures, one for each side. That's the big difference, right? So think about how much um, an Uber driver pays to be on Uber or how much of their, their income they give up versus how much a passenger pays and how much that goes to Uber versus the rider. Um, think about... Um, Oh, I was just thinking of a good one. You can think about a uh, used car dealership as being a sort of analog two-party platform, a two-sided platform. They take a car from uh, you and pay you for it and then sell it at a markup to someone else, sort of a middleman position, right? So a two-sided platform is connecting one party with another. And so there could be two different prices for those groups based on the value. Uh, we talked about dating apps. We talked about auction sites. We talked about um, connecting... Um, buyers and sellers on Amazon and eBay. Um, they can set prices based on the value of accessing the other party. So if it's really important to me to access students and I need to use a media platform to do that, like YouTube, if it's really valuable to me, then YouTube can charge me. On the other hand, if viewers really want to access my content, then they can charge viewers. They can charge viewers by imposing ads as a cost or charging you to remove the ads. And so that reveals the value to the two parties. And so that's a really useful way to think about it. We can infer from the fact that companies like Facebook and Google charge little or nothing to use their services, that they're getting benefits from somewhere else and or they're charging the other side. 
So the fact that Facebook is pre is free means that the other side of the platform is where all the expense is coming from. So if we think about Facebook as not being a social network, but as being a way for advertisers to access specific markets, the fact that we as the people who are marketed to pay nothing means that the advertisers pay for access to us because they value accessing us. Does that make sense? Same thing with Google. You don't pay for a Google search, but advertisers pay for priority, for types of advertising, for different things. And that's because accessing our eyeballs is way more valuable than us accessing advertisers. We don't actually want to access advertisers. So that gets at the nature of two-sided platforms. Uh, number four, explain the three modern theories of predatory pricing. What do they assume and how can they help monopolists maintain market dominance? So this one was pretty specific. There were three main theories. Uh, one of them was test market predation, this idea that firms can use predatory pricing to obscure the real prices and keep new or incumbent firms from entering the market. Um, there was the theory of financial market predation, which is based on the idea that financial markets have a little bit of an information asymmetry problem. They sell complex goods. And so it's hard to tell when a financial industry or a financial market is doing a good job. Oops, sorry, guys. Um, and um, so financial market predation is this idea that if you don't know it's hard to know the nature of the quality of goods in financial markets. There's some information asymmetry. It can be hard to tell when a financial market or a financial firm has gone under because they did a bad job versus they were subject to predatory pricing. And so because it's harder to discern the quality of the products, we can see predatory pricing be really effective in financial markets. Um, if we were looking at sandwich shops and a really, it's really easy to tell when a sandwich is really good. If a really good sandwich which shop goes out of business, we could say, wow, how does that make sense? Those were the best sandwiches I've ever had. They always had lines out the door. Financial industry, financial markets, it's a lot harder to tell the quality and kind of the good because of the complexity of the goods. And so it's easier to engage in that predation without knowing for sure. And so you can sort of make it look like a firm is taking losses because they're bad, not because they're subject to predatory pricing. And then the third um, example of a modern theory of predatory pricing was signaling theory of predatory pricing. And this was the idea that predatory pricing wasn't necessarily going to force firms out of business, but it created a signal that sort of acts as a barrier to entry and says, hey, this market is really competitive. Are you sure you want to be in here? I don't think you can cut it. And so it's sort of um, signaling that this is a really competitive market and that you don't want to engage. So you can kind of think about Amazon, right? We've debated back and forth whether they're actually engaging in predatory pricing. You could make the argument of that signaling theory, right? They're telling other retailers, you can't compete on our level. Look how competitive we are. You might be able to compete on some small level, but we're sending a signal out there that we are cutthroat. So those are the three modern theories. Um, Test market predation, financial market predation, and signaling theory of predation. Cool. Extra credit. What is the connection between the public comment period of the process of regulation creation and the economic theory of regulation? It's kind of an obscure, obscure question. Get points for how well you answered it. The basic idea here is economic theory of regulation says there's a trade-off, right? That um, that gets back to that Pelser, Peltzman curve. Uh, that Peltzman model where it says, hey, um, there is firms want to maximize profits, which are a function of price. Consumers want to minimize price. There is this par parabola where as prices go up, profits go up until they start to go down. So that's going to be that profit curve. And then there's the reality that um, regulators want to maximize support. So there are these support curves and the support is a function of profits and price because profits make firms happy, prices make individuals, households happy. They want to make both happy, but in order to make households happy, you want to have lower prices. And in order to make firms happy, they want high profits, which means high prices. 
And so they sort of maximize these with these support curves. That wasn't a great one. Let's try it again. And so they're going to pick the price, the sort of regulation price that maximizes consumer support and firm support. So this would be the monopolist price. This would be, we can move this over a little bit probably because we're not saying that we'd price it at zero, but we'd price it at zero economic profit, right? So that would be our perfect competition price. And then the regulator is gonna set the price here to maximize their support. The public comment period in the process of regulation creation allows interest groups, including households, including firms, including NGOs, to comment on their opinion of regulation. And so when we talk about the mechanism through which economic theory of regulation works, we can think about that public comment period as being the mechanism. So if firm and industry leaders go in and comment, this regulation is problematic, blah, 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 blah. They're saying, hey, we're going to remove support if you don't keep prices high. If consumer groups and individual households are commenting and saying, you know, we hate this regulation, we want to change it this way, blah, 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 blah. They're saying, hey, our support function is really going to be powered by price. And so it's a signal to regulators of what that support curve, that support function might look like. Maybe it is right here on this part. Maybe it's closer. Maybe the tangency curve is more like this, something like that. And so we can think about that being the mechanism by which regulators learn the opinions of households and firms um, through that public comment period. Make sense? Hopefully. Hopefully that was a nice little surprise at the end to have some extra credit points. Um, that's it. That was the exam. Let me know what questions you have. Um, and let's close this out. Okay, so that's the midterm. Let me know in the discussion thread what questions you have about the midterm um, and everything going forward. So uh, our plan for the rest of the semester, we were supposed to have covered chapter 13 on incentive regulation before spring break. We didn't make it before the midterm and we're just going to let that chapter go. It's a cool chapter. It looks at other types of incentive regulation besides just prices and profits. So different ways to um, regulate natural monopolies. What we're going to start with next week or this week is starting to look at natural monopolies, chapter 14. Um, and so what that's going to mean is we're going to start looking at dynamic issues in natural monopolies. So natural monopolies that change over time. Um, we're going to look at monopolies, natural monopolies becoming not natural monopolies. And um, we're going to kind of really open up that. We're going to look at the case study of broadband internet access. We're going to look at net neutrality in the book. Um, and it's a really exciting chapter. This was really exciting a couple of years ago because there was a lot of talk about what it meant to repeal net neutrality. And we saw that take place. We haven't seen the sort of doomsday um, effects of that that we thought we would, but we have seen some issues. So for Friday's class, I want you to take a look at chapter 14, um, start looking at it. It's going to be a lot more graph based. We're going to be looking at a lot more natural monopoly models. So again, you want to remember, we're going to be looking at situations where we have cost curves that don't make it rational to have multiple firms, right? We're going to have cost curves that look more like this. And so depending on where our demand curve is, we might only have a rationale for one firm to be producing the entire quantity. But we might see situations, and this is that dynamic component, where if the demand increases enough, maybe we can start to have two firms producing the total quantity, right? 
So now this is Q star, which is equal to Q1 plus Q2. And so basically moving from a natural monopoly to an oligopoly and how regulations have to adjust in that situation. Um, so this is a really exciting chapter. There's a lot of really interesting stuff in there. So take a look at chapter 14. I'll put some slides up and put some notes up for you all. And we'll get started on that on Friday. Uh, remember that Wednesday, um, March 31st is Cesar Chavez Day. Campus is closed, but I will see you all back to normal finally on April 2nd on Friday. Thanks so much. Let me know what questions you have. Feel free to email, post, post questions in the discussion thread, or uh, make an appointment with me on my You Can Book Me site. Great. Thanks.